Hello and welcome everyone to Cyverse's Focus Forum webinar on making your data fair with Cyverse, presented by Ramona Walls. I'm Tina Lee, I'm the Cyverse user engagement team person. And um, today's webinar will be one hour and it'll include about 10 minutes at the end or within that hour for questions and answers. Uh, before we start, some quick housekeeping, please. Please um, enable the chat feature on the Zoom link uh, so that you can type in any questions that occur to you during Ramona's presentation. Um, she'll answer those at the end. And if you haven't already, please disable your microphone. Um, or not disable, I should say, just uh, silence yourself so that we don't have any disturbance during the presentation. Uh, within approximately 24 hours, we'll post this video on a wiki page, and I'm about to put that in the chat window, um, so that you can um, find these materials afterwards and review them at your leisure. Um, what else? Uh, we would also be sending you a uh, post-webinar survey for input afterwards. Um, it's very short, and I just really request any um, comments to help us improve the webinars or topics for future webinars, things like that. And finally, stay tuned for upcoming webinars in 2019. We'll be doing some on doing more with Jupyter Notebooks, doing more with Docker, building Vice, our shiny apps, advanced data store, and other topics. Um, we're in the process of scheduling these, so visit our website uh, for notifications and announcements. So without further ado, here's Ramona Walls, uh, Cyverse's uh, science informatician to lead the webinar. Thanks, Tina. If you stop sharing, then I can share. It. Right. There we go. Okay, thank you. Excellent. So thank you, Tina. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in today. Um, so let me get the presentation up on the screen. As Tina said, I'm a science informatician. informatician at the University of Arizona at Cyverse. Um, and my, my primary role here at Cyverse is the product champion for our data commons. And the data commons includes a repository for publishing data, but it also includes features throughout Cyverse infrastructure um, that can allow data to live as a searchable, discoverable, computable, and reusable resource. Um, and so that was a vision statement that we wrote several years ago, and it just happens to very, um, closely coincide with the FAIR data principles. And so we have, um, since they've been published, we have been trying our best to, to, to comply with the FAIR data principles and to help our users comply with them. And that was really the inspiration behind today's webinar. So what we're gonna talk about today is what the FAIR princ data principles are and why they would matter to scientists or um, some of you are probably infrastructure developers as well. Uh, we'll go over some of the general best practices for making your data FAIR and then we'll go into some specific, I'll list some specific tools and resources that are available in Cybers that you can use to make your data fair and just for general data management. Um, and I'll finish up with a number of quick demos, including how to share and publish your data through the Cybers Data Commons. So what are fair data? So when we think about data sharing, um, this is the, the vision that might come to mind. Someone you know, publishes a paper and you say, hey, this data would be really useful for my study. Let me contact the author. Hey, can I reuse your data? Sure, here you go, here's the file, et cetera. And that's the idealized world, but the reality of data sharing is often more like this. Now, it's not that there's actually this open animosity between scientists, though occasionally there is. It's more that there are, in fact, still a number of barriers to sharing data and reusing data, even just discovering data that's been published. Um, and as a result of that, um, a group of, of researchers got together several years ago and had a lot of discussions, a lot of community-based discussions. There was extensive input into this. And they published this paper in Nature Scientific Data, uh, the link here is at the bottom, on the FAIR data principles. And these are a set of principles or guidelines on what you can do to make your data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, so why would you even want to do that? Well, there are a number of motivations, I think, that are important for scientists. Um, the first and foremost, perhaps the most selfish one or the biggest carrot really is that it can make your life easier. So good data management practices um, allow you to manage your own data, to, to, to find your own data, to access your own data, to make it interoperable and to reuse it. Because the reality is the person who is most likely to reuse your data is yourself. 
Um, so if you've, if, you've, if you've managed it well and made it easier for yourself to understand, it can really make your life a lot easier. Um, second, improve your reputation. So data publications are scientific output. I do realize that many in the scientific community don't value data publications the same way that they value um, scientific articles, like research articles, but those attitudes are changing. And certainly within funders, there's, there's recognition of the value of publishing um, and making data sets available for others to reuse. Um, so much recognition, in fact, that if you want to apply for funding, you, in order to meet the, re meet the requirements of funders, you will almost, for most funding agencies, have to provide a data management plan. Um, all of the new, um, the new um, solicitations that just came out from the National Science Foundation Bio Directorate um, have explicit statements about, about creating a data management plan and that that data management plan should follow the FAIR uh, data principles. And so um, basically, if you want to write a good plan that's going to be reviewed, it will be reviewed as part of your proposal, um, then it really behooves you to understand what the FAIR principles are and know how to comply with them. Um, of course, as a scientist, if you're interested in practicing reproducible science, then making your data fair is really a key element of that. Um, and I think that was one of, the, one, of the, one of the motivations, of course, of the funders as well, is that there's been a lot of upcry lately about the lack of reproducibility in science. And so one of the, one of the solutions to that problem is making sure that the data that was used to generate, um, to generate conclusions is available for other people to, to, um, to go back and see if they get the same results. Um, and of course, as scientists, most of us are really interested in supporting the common good. And so if you spend a lot of time um, and often public funds generating data, you can make very good use of it. But the chances are that you will never be able to extract the full value from that data on your own. So putting it out there into the public um, allows, allows that data, its, its full value to be realized. So what does it mean then to be fair? I'm gonna go through the, the, the different bullets of the fair principles and I'll go through them fairly quickly, but if you're really interested, please go back and read the, um, read the, 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 uh, the manuscript that's linked, the paper that's linked early in that slide. Um, and so findable, so there are a series of principles, as I said, they're numbered for F findable, accessible, interoperable, reuse. So these are the findable principles. And so they say things like, metadata must be assigned a globally unique and persistent identifier. So that, for example, is um, often a digital object identifier or DOI that lets you find the data. Um, the data have to be described with rich metadata. The metadata are clearly and explicitly include that identifier. So it's not enough to issue a DOI for a data set. The DOI has to actually be connected to the data so that people can find it. Um, and the data have to be registered and in indexed in a searchable research. Otherwise, nobody can find them. Um, so, you're noticing probably already that there's the word metadata and data or, or meta parentheses data used a lot in here. And so, although many of you are probably familiar with what metadata is, I just want to stop for a second and kind of point out in the context specifically of data publication and the FAIR principles, what's the difference between the data and the metadata. So what I'm showing you here is an example of a page from the Cybers Data Commons. It's a landing page for a particular data set, a data set about, um, about a, a load phosphate study experiment. Um, and so what you see on the top half of this page is all the metadata about the data set. So there's the identifier listed in there. Um, there's the creator, a description of the data set, who the publisher is, what year was published. Um, the rights, you'll see this in one of the, in the, in the reusable, you'll see how important it is to actually put the, to list the, um, the uh, licensing about a data set and then the citation. And, and there's actually more, if you click on the show more button, you could see the full metadata associated with the data set. And that's distinguished then from these, these are down here, which are the actual data. So we've got a number of folders containing uh, maker annotations, SNP files, spam files, and a readme text. So these are, these are the actual data that are being published, and this is the metadata about it, just to make that clear. Um, okay, so moving on then, what does it mean to be accessible? So that means you have to be able to, it's one thing to find the data and know that it exists, but then you have to actually be able to get it and bring it, download it to where you want to use it. So it has to be, the identifier actually has to connect to the data in some way, so it has to be retrievable using standard protocols. That protocol has to be open and usable by anybody. Um, it has to allow for authentication where necessary because not all data can be completely open um, without, you know, so that anyone can look at it. For example, there some data sets that would be published and still considered fair, but might be protected either because they describe um, human health, human patients, or um, 
endangered species, et cetera. There are various reasons why you might want authentication associated with your data. Um, and so the last one is interesting. Metadata are accessible even when the data are no longer available. So that's a recognition that it's not really feasible to preserve all data for all time. Um, but we should at least make an effort um, to preserve that metadata record that describes the data as long as possible um, so that someone will know what was there and what, where it is and where, what it was, sorry. So in terms of interoperability, this is really a tough one. So this really has to do with um, making sure that, pe that the data is, um, the, the scientific and um, technical content of the data is very well explained. So this has to do with um, using, so metadata use formal accessible um, applicable language for knowledge representation. So this, and, and use vocabularies that follow fair principles. These are essentially ontologies or metadata standards um, that you've probably heard of. Um, they need to include references to other data and metadata. So that's really important, for example, that you have a metadata item that links back to the publication that fully describes the research. Um, so that's one way you can do that. Or there might be um, data sets that are derived from your data set. So if you've derived a new data set, you always want to link back to the original data set to that DOI. And so those are key, key elements for interoperability. And finally, for reusable, again, it comes down really to the metadata. So you have to have richly described um, um, metadata with a plurality of attributes. So it's not enough to just say, this data set's about rice. Um, a person who's going and trying to reuse your data needs to really understand what it's about, um, what this, this number 1.2 about, about detailed provenance. So provenance is the history of, I mean, provenance you might have heard of in the, in the art world. It's talking about what was the history of a, of a piece of art or an antique book or something, tracing who's owned it, where did it come from, what was it derived. Well, the same principle has been translated into data. So you want to talk about um, what were the steps that were used to create this data, where was it stored, who handled it over time. So that provenance information is really under, important for understanding um, the reliability of data. Is it what it says it is? Um, and so, uh, and finally, as I mentioned, this, this clear and, and accessible data usage license. Without a license, um, you basically have no guidance about whether or not data can be reused. And so legally, that puts the, mo that puts the most restrictions. So having no license on your data is effectively the same as putting the most restrictive license on your data. Um, so even if you're not willing to go full um, open access, you should at least consider putting some sort of license that makes it clear what your reuse conditions are for the data. So um, I, for this presentation, I looked at the data that's in the Cyverse Data Commons, the curated data. These are data sets that have DOIs. And I, I very informally evaluated them against the different um, against the different FAIR principles. And so green means that they're compliant, yellow means that they comply but could be improved, and red means that they don't comply. And so I'm very happy to find that I don't, there's, there's none of the principles where we are not complying at all. And all of the principles that are in yellow really have to do um, with metadata. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons that I wanted to have this, this webinar was to say, is that I can't add that metadata for you. You as the data creators, have to uh, collect the metadata and you have to include it in the data sets when you publish it. And I realize that that's work and we are definitely constantly trying to come up with tools that make it easier for you to record that metadata and to carry it on and publish it. Um, but it also means that the users have to you know, make a little bit of effort to make sure that that's there. And so hopefully this webinar will give you some of the basic ideas about how you can do that and help to bring these yellow, um, these yellow principles up to green for, for published data on Cybers. So with that, what can you do? <laughs> what are some of the steps that you can do to, to make your data um, fair? And these are, these are not specifically to cybers. These are very high level um, steps. And so the first one is really to learn about data management. And I know as scientists, we are constantly being told you have to learn this, you have to learn that. It's not enough to just know science anymore and to be a good writer and to be able to think clearly and communicate. Um, you also have to be able to manage data because when um, most science was done in a lab notebook, so everything that you did during the day could be written down on a single or two few pages, that was one data management challenge. But now that, that um, scientific projects, the data often spans multiple terabytes, um, it becomes more challenging to manage that. And so scientists are being forced to become data managers as well. Um, and so there are a lot of resources out there on data management. Um, it is an evolving field. So 
don't necessarily expect to find the answer to every question that you're looking for, but you can really, it's good to educate yourself about some basic things. Um, if you're considering, as I said, applying for, for, for funding, then you will need to write a data management plan. Even if you're not applying for funding, I highly encourage you to write a data management plan for your project before you start. And so here's a really nice article on 10 simple rules for creating a good one. There's also this great new tool called the DMP tool. Um, and it actually has templates that connect to various um, funding agencies, NIH, NSF, and other organizations. So you can, you can use that to help you build your data management plan. Um, in terms of managing individual files, every scientist's favorite tool is the Excel spreadsheet. I, am, I use it as much, almost as much as everybody else. Um, and so, but that said, I think there's been a lot of talk lately about the, the shortcomings of using spreadsheets. So if you are going to use them, and you probably are, just please have a look at this quick article about how to use them properly. It'll help you um, avoid some of the common pitfalls that can arise while using spreadsheets. In a more general sense, um, if you're just looking for some basic information, the data carpentry, so if you've heard of software carpentry where they teach um, basic coding skills, data carpentry teaches basic data management skills. And so you can go to their website and they have a lot of online tutorials there. Or you can consider becoming a data carpentry instructor, or setting up uh, workshops at your own institution. Data One also has a lot of resources for data management, and this is the link to where their best practices are. Um, and then if your, if your research in, includes writing code or developing new algorithms and tools, then this is a really useful article, Best Practices for Scientific Computing, that I've included here. So along with learning the, um, the if you're going to learn the basics of data management, I should say that one of the, the key principles that you will see in all of these things that I pointed you out to um, is the data life cycle. Um, and so um, I'm guessing that many of you have heard of a data life cycle. Um, if you haven't, well, now you have. And so this is, a, this is an example of a, comp, of a very simple data life cycle. So you can think about, you start generating data, you analyze it, you publish it. Um, it gets rediscovered, someone reuses it, and that leads to the generation of new data. Um, and the reason this is important for managing your data is that the steps you need to take um, are different depending on when, when you, uh, let, me, let me say that another way. If you think about your data as participating in a cycle, not just as a one-way street where you generate your data, analyze it, you publish it, boom, that's the end of it. That's going to lead to different data management practices than if you recognize that your data will actually need to be discovered and reused. So during the generation step, step, during the analysis step, you can be collecting the information you need to support reuse and discovery. Um, and even for publication, most of us are so busy just trying to do our analyses that we're not thinking about, oh, what am I going to need to, what am I going to need to provide when I'm ready to publish this? But if you're thinking about, okay, I'm gonna to have to publish this, I'm gonna need this information, let me write it down now, as soon as I'm collecting the data, um, that, will, that will support making your data fair later on and hopefully make your life easier in the future, even though it might mean a little more work at the moment. Using metadata, so as you noticed in those fair data principles, nearly every single one of them, uh, at, least, at least three quarters of them have the word metadata in them. And so I talked about what metadata is, so it's the set of data that describes give, and gives information about other data. And um, I know that machine learning and uh, natural language processing and, and full content indexing are very popular topics right now. We're very engaged in those at Cybers. Um, and they, I think a lot of people are holding onto this hope that they will never have to use metadata because the computer will just look at their file, understand what everything is, and be able to produce all the metadata and information needed that way. Um, and that will probably be the case in maybe 20 to 50 years, but it's not going to be anytime soon. And so the bottom line is that the only way to really make your data understandable is through good metadata. Um, and so just another reminder about the difference between data and metadata. If your image is the data, then all the things describing that image, what's the file name, what, what, what were the conditions under it was taken, where was it taken, when was it taken, et cetera. That's the kind of metadata that's really important for making that reusable. Image data is actually a really nice case because most cameras record a lot of metadata automatically and so they take the job of you having to write it down out of it. What they don't record is things like um, what were the treatment, <laughs> um, uh, what were the treatments, what was the genotype, etc. That sort of metadata, even for image data, still needs to be written down. Um, 
So organizing your data, another really key uh, step of data management is how to organize all of your data. Again, if you just have a few files, you can just put them on your local computer, you put them in a folder, it's all fine. But once you start getting into hundreds of files, even thousands of files, very, very common nowadays, um, you need a plan for organizing them. Um, everyone's favorite, um, favorite um, practice for organizing data is of course is using file and folder naming conventions and those are really useful and I'm not suggesting you don't use them. In fact, I do suggest that you use them. Um, but realize that they have limitations. You can't do everything with, um, with, um, with file names. So uh, with file names and folder organizations. So um, I'm going to actually give a little demo later, a very quick demo about how you can use metadata to actually organize your data in a more flexible way. Uh, another general principle is avoiding unnecessarily deep hierarchy. So just rule of thumb, if you're hierarchy, you know, if you've got more than three or four levels of folders, you've probably got something too deep going on. That often arises because some proprietary software turns out data with these ridiculously deep hierarchies and, and that makes it very difficult to find your data in the future. Um, really basic step before you start your project write down what you're gonna do and this is really if you if you're um, working on a project with more than one person this is um, absolutely essential you have to agree beforehand how you're going to organize and name the data um, even with yourself though it's worth doing it just for a project with one person um, you'll need to develop a strategy for version control the reality is that People do, there are multiple copies of data living in multiple places. You need to keep track of what's what, where it is, and what's been done to it. Um, Cyverse, because of the volumes of data that we house, does not offer the kind of um, automated version control that you would see in something like Google Docs, where you can just go back and have, see the versions of every past version anytime you make a change. Um, However, you can set up systems to keep track of versions, so you'll need to decide what versions, et cetera. So that's a, there's, look in the literature, there's a whole lot of discussion about how to best do that. Um, really simple practice when naming your files, if you're gonna be using computational infrastructure, avoid special characters and spaces in your names. Um, and then here's another guide that, the, the, it's a real short guide at the, that the uh, library at the University of Pennsylvania has come out, has, has produced on file organization that's, that I think is, is somewhat useful. There we go. Um, and so last, practicing reproducible science. So um, the steps that you take to practice reproducible science will also produce fair data. So these include things like recording metadata at the same time you collect the data, not just waiting until you're ready to publish it, um, keeping track of your workflows and data provenance. That can be as simple as having a text document that you keep open and you write down everything that you do. Um, it can be a little bit more sophisticated with new tools like um, or Studio and Jupyter Notebooks, um, or if you're really doing large analyses, you can use workflow managers that will keep track of this. Um, if you need to create a data dictionary, a data dictionary is just um, like a glossary that lists all of the column headers <laughs> in all of your files and says what they mean. And so, uh, and, and one, of the, one of the advantages of doing that is that it keeps you from, you, it, it, sorry, it forces you to use the same column header across different files so you don't write um, for example, you wouldn't write like like um, collection date on one, collection underscore date, or call date on another, or CD on a third file. So you would just pick a single name and use that across all of your different resources. Um, of course, using non-proprietary data formats means that people can access and report in the future. So using CSV files instead of Excel files, you can still do your work in Excel, but then for publication, you would want to put it into CSV. Um, and then finally, of course, publishing your data in an open repository is important for reproducibility. So that leads to the question then of where do you publish your data? So there are a lot of places where you can publish, and this is a very, um, this is a challenging subject, and, and, and it's not necessarily easy to know where to publish your data, especially if you're doing work that might be in a domain that's not that's a little bit outside the field that you've been working in traditionally. Um, so there are a number of da domain-specific databases and repositories. So think about things like, um, like Maze GDB for Maze um, or all the various um, model organism databases that are helpful there. Um, specialized repositories, uh, something like NCBI. So if you want to publish sequence data, it's going to go into the, one of the International Nucleotide Sequence Data Centers like NCBI in the US. Um, 
There are also generalist repositories like Data Dryad or um, Dataverse that will essentially publish any kind of, of scientific of, of research data sets. And then local repositories. I put a star on that because you really have to evaluate those carefully before you decide whether or not to publish in them. Um, if they are, if you do want to publish to a local repository, then just check to make sure that it's actually complying with some of those fair data principles. Does it issue a DOI for your data set? Does it ask you for the appropriate metadata? Does it serve that metadata? Does it have a place, where it, is it easy for people to get to the data? And I guess my local repository is probably the most common um, case in there would be like institute, like university libraries, but other institutions might have um, local repositories as well. Um, where should you not publish your data for it to be open? Well, journal supplements. Um, journal supplements are, they have their use, but not necessarily for data publication. Aside from the fact that they're often behind paywalls, um, they don't usually store the data in a format that's accessible. Um, they don't require any metadata. Uh, they rarely have a DOI. So very few journal supplements are really considered, would be considered good places to, to publish fair data. And of course, the very last place you should consider quote unquote publishing your data is on your own local computer or hard drive, because that is essentially a one way street to never being seen again. Yes, you can share it with people as long as you're alive, which I hate to break it to you, it's not gonna be forever. Um, and, you know, until you can't use that computer anymore because your hard drive fries or you forget where you put it, et cetera. So just bear in mind that they're, they're um, although it's easy, there are many reasons not to, not to just keep your data locally. Please try to get it out there. Um, okay, thanks for the folks who are putting up questions, by the way. So in order to make sure that we keep this within an hour, I'm going to come back and address those at the end of the presentation. Um, so if you're struggling to figure out where to publish your data, these are some really helpful resources. The fairsharing.org allows you to search and has a number of different lists, a number of uh, databases. It also, it also has standards, um, which are really helpful in ontologies and vocabularies. Re3Data is another resource for, um, for repositories. And Scientific Data also has their own list of, of, of repositories. So you can search any of those. Um, I actually don't know enough about them to say which one is the best. Um, Probably if you go to one and don't find something that seems suitable for you, then try the other ones. Um, if you're publishing um, in, for, for in the agriculture community or um, for specific, working in a specific organism, then AgBioData is a group of, um, of all of the different databases associated with agri agriculture. Um, and so they have a list of their member databases, which can also help you find your you know, species or clade specific um, database. Okay, so those are high-level principles about how you should, um, how you, what things you can do to make your data fair, but then what are some tools that can actually help you to do this? Because it's great to know them in principle, but putting it into practice can actually be a lot more challenging. Um, so Cypress has, as part of the data commons, as I mentioned, we're trying to support the whole life cycle. So not just at publication, but tools for pre, during, and post publication. So a number of data man things that you can use to help manage your data. Um, one is um, if you're interested, so one of, the, one of the really popular, one of the reasons that people come to Cybers, I should say, has to do with the fact that you can share data. So if you're working on a group project and you need to have multiple collaborators that have access to the data at the same time or access to the same analysis tools or access to the same workflows, those can all be stored on Cybers. And so um, I have created this, this um, quick start. Oh, did I not? I look, I didn't, maybe it's, well, the link is here. I think I'm, 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 so let me just go there. Copy that. So the link is in, is in the, is in the, um, is in the presentation, which you'll be able to download. So anyway, it basically just talks about, um, you know, what, what are some, so if you're new to Cybers and you want to set up a share project and you're not familiar with our infrastructure, this will give you links to some of the basic things like, you know, how to, um, how to, how to um, create an account for the members of your project. So how you can share the, the, how you can share data within your project. What are our data policies? And so you're wondering, well, you know, my allocation is 100 gigabytes, but I'm putting this folder and it needs and I need 10 gigabytes. Well, why is that coming off of my allocation? Well, this just says, that, you know, basically, you can, we will, if, if, you're, if you're the PI for a big shared project, we understand that and you will get a larger data allocation. You just have to ask for it. So it's pretty simple. 
This talks about some, this links to some of the common tools we're using for managing data, like the discovery environment and iCommands and CyberDuck. Um, some tips on um, how to manage your data, who to, who to be, in, who should be in charge of it. Some tips for sharing tools. You can also set up the tools and analysis, etc. So that's a really simple guide just for for getting you started there. Um, back to this. Um, how to use your metadata efficiently. So I was like, keep driving home this metadata, metadata, metadata. Um, and so we have, uh, we do have a fairly sophisticated metadata system and it's, we are making improvements to it every month. There's new, new features coming out. Um, so please do check back in the learning center for new tools. So, but in the meantime, um, let me just say that this is the link here to the manual for using metadata in the wiki. Um, also read the docs. This is a little bit more basic, um, showing you how to, how to um, use metadata. So just kind of high level, some of the use of metadata there, some documentation. You can do bulk metadata upload. So if you've got your metadata in a CSV file, you can upload it and apply it to one or multiple files at the same time. And so I think in order to, instead of just showing you a bunch of links, I'm gonna do a quick demo here so you can see what I'm talking about and how this works. So in the discovery environment, um, let's say that we, we have, so um, well, actually let me, before I do that demo, let me just do a couple of things. I'm gonna talk, show you the metadata interface. So let me just go to a random folder here and we want to um, add some metadata to it. So on the right side, edit view metadata, or you can also use the metadata, let me just see, make it plus, it's there. Hopefully people can see that better. Um, so in the metadata menu, edit view the metadata. And this allows you to, um, now there's, you can see there's no metadata on this, so I can add metadata. I could call this new attribute. I could call it like um, species, Ariza sativa. And there's no unit, so I'll just delete that. So I can save that if I want. But I might want to say, you know, this is, I'm, I'm the, um, so I'm the uh, creator of this file. And no units, I'll delete that and we'll save that. So I've got some metadata on there and that's useful and I'll show you some other ways that, that can be useful. Um, now suppose that you actually wanted to publish this data to, uh, to get a DUI for this data set. In that case, as I'll show you later, you actually need to apply a metadata template that, that has a set of predefined fields for metadata. So in this case, we're gonna select the DOI request metadata template. And if you were, like I said, if you were requesting a DOI, you would go through these steps. So I'm going to give it a title, the title, and um, oh, this is where I did went wrong. I I I did something. I'm going to cancel this. I forgot what I, I called this creator. I should have called it data site. Not creator. So I've already created this, and in the future, you won't have to include this dot data site. Sorry, that's a little bit confusing. That's about to change. Um, so we go to the metadata template and we apply it. And you can see then that the creator field that I already created has filled in automatically. So if I filled in any of these other fields, they would show up here automatically. So that means if you supply metadata for one template and it has the same field in a different template, you won't have to enter it twice. It just gets stored. The template is like a view that sits on top of the metadata and just organizes it in the way you want. So you can fill this out and this gives you a predefined set of metadata fields, which is really nice. Um, so that's fairly straightforward. It's telling me I did because I didn't fill in all the required fields. It's giving me a little bit of warning, but I can still save it, so I'm going to ignore that. Now, um, I just want to give you a quick preview because we are actually in the midst of updating our metadata, our metadata views. So probably within the next month, it's going to look different. <laughs> so I'll show you what it's going to look like, just so that when you so you aren't completely surprised. Um, so this will change as well. So but when I when I apply a template it's gonna have a new view that looks more like this, which I hope is easy, a little bit more user-friendly and easy to use. And one of the things that's really crucial, uh, interesting about this template and what's the, this view, what's different about it, is that um, it allows for nested me metadata. So you can see that I have a metadata field called title. So if you remember in the old one, it's just you had attribute, value, and unit. So here the attribute is title, and then I filled in a, va a value for it, which is called the data set. I've already filled this one in. But in addition to having a value, I can also have some other properties. So I can have a title type, for example, um, and I can select, uh, make it a alternative title. 
And you can select the language. In this case, it's US English, but you can change other titles if you want. So this allows you to basically add metadata to metadata. And this is really important because one, the data site um, standard for publishing data requires these nested fields. And it also allows you to create more sophisticated metadata. And if you're, if you're using um, ontologies, this allows you to basically um, link, link ontology terms to, from one field to another. Um, and speaking of using ontologies, so I don't want to save, no, okay. So um, we've got, I'll cancel that. So there's, uh, I've, I've just created this, a couple of new term, uh, templates that allow you to use ontology fields. So if you want to mark up your data with terms from ontologies, um, you can use this, a, a simple template that we've got here. So edit view metadata. And currently I have templates only for the environment ontology and the plant ontology. I plan to add the gene ontology. And if people want to use ontologies from other terms, please let me know and I will add those in there. It's really a simple matter. So let's say we wanted to add some plant ontology terms to this. So we have two, two possible fields, uh, plant anatomical entity and plant development stage. If you hover over the, the I, you can see this says select a term from the plant anatomical entity branch of the PO, which includes plant structures, spaces, and substances. So I'll do, I'll start typing. And this is actually using the API from the ontology lookup service to go and search all the child terms of plant anatomical entity. And say I wanna use, um, uh, flower bud here as my and to, to, to associate that term here and then I might want to put a development stage as well so again what are the stages associated with flowers I maybe want to do that during the one half of flowers open stage and so that's how you could add these ontology terms to your to your fields and these these um, ontology fields can be in, 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 uh, included into templates that are more complicated as well okay so let me go back here and make sure what I'm supposed to demo next so we've got uh, bulk metadata and upload is something I want to show you. So this is a really useful feature. So let's not save that. We'll go back here. So we'll go to here. So I've made up this data set. It's just completely random made up. But let's pretend this was a data set describing some measurements that we took on a bunch of rice plants under several different treatments in different days. And so I want to upload some metadata to it. So let me um, actually just show you the file, the metadata. So what I did was, you know, locally I've been storing my metadata. So I've created this file here that's called uh, rice metadata. And you can see it's just a comma separated value file. It's got the file name, the plant ID, the species, the, the type. The type is whether it's this indica or japonica treatment, cold or warm treatments, and the day of year in which the data was collected. Again, this is completely made up. There's not actually any data here, just to show you. But you can see that we've got different species. We have different species, we've got different types, we've got cultivars essentially, we've got different treatments. And so suppose this is not eight files, but 7,000 files or 100 files even. And I wanna organize, and I'm trying to decide, well, do I need to set up my folder hierarchy based on species or a cultivar? Should I set up my folder hierarchy based on treatment or day of year? What if I then wanna get all of those files from the same day of year? Or if I want to get all the ones from the same treatment and they're in a different organization, what do I do with it? So having the metadata there really allows you to, to organize the data on the fly in the way that you need at that moment. So in order to do that, first we need to, need to get the metadata in there. So I will um, apply some bulk metadata. So I'm going to go here. Oops, sorry, let me go back to that folder. First I need to get the upload that file. So I do a simple upload and choose the file. From my desktop, price metadata, and upload. And that just takes a minute. And if I refresh, you can see that the file is there now. And then I can click on any folder, I want, any file I want, and do metadata. It doesn't actually matter where I click for this. Um, I do metadata. Uh, no, I have to go up one. Sorry, I guess it doesn't matter where I click. So let me go up to one level and go. Metadata, apply bulk metadata. Select the file. And that would be the file that I just uploaded. All of this is documented in their links here on the documentation of how to do this. There's even a video tutorial for it. And so if you, if you notice that um, here, the file name was the first column. And since the metadata file is in the same directory as all of the files, I don't have to list the full path. You can also use this to apply metadata to, to files scattered throughout your home directory, um, as long as you include the full path in that first column. So 
in this case I didn't, so I say okay. And so just take a moment to happen. Metadata successfully applied. So now when I go back into this folder, I can click on one of the files and edit view metadata. And there's all that metadata applied to it. You see it has the plant ID, the species, the type, the treatment, the day of year. Okay. And so, um, as I said, I've just got these in a flat, flat folder, no hierarchy, no description, but I need to be able to maybe find, I want to find all of the files that have, um, that are in this directory that are, on a, that, that had a cold treatment, for example. So I can, let me copy this path. Then I go to the search bar here. Okay, so new search interface, I add one, I want to say, um, oh, that's interesting. Shows up behind. Um, well, let me minimize that for a second. So I want to go file path. There's path. Path. Uh, sorry. I'm not sure what I've done here. Of course, it's a live demo, so things aren't working the way I expect them to. All right, let me try this again. If it doesn't work, <laughs> then I won't be able to demo it, unfortunately. It worked an hour ago. Okay, the metadata is there, and then I want to do the search. Path begins with, um, what I copied this. Oh, I didn't copy it thoroughly, apparently. Yeah, there, I plan home, okay. And then I want to add another one. And um, yeah, this is, this is really funky. Um, let's just go to, let me minimize. I'm gonna have to do this a couple times, sorry. Well, I will report a bug for this. I'll do metadata, let's see, let's just saved. Oh, I keep clicking on the wrong thing. Search. So metadata is uh, treatment and the value is cold. Okay. So I can save this so that I have the search saved and then I will basically, it's creating like a smart folder. If you have that on your computer, if you ever use that, you save a search and it will automatically save all the files that meet this criteria. Um, so I can come back to it. But right now, I'll just do a search, and then the result should show up. Hmm. Treatment is cold. Well, okay, again, it worked an hour ago. Um, it's possible that the indexing doesn't happen instantaneously, and so the search is not happening right away. Um, because so, But what should, what should be showing right now is a list of all those files, which would be, in this case, file 012, 123, four, five, six, and five, six, seven, because those have the cold, the treatment with the value cold. Um, and I assure you that I did test this and it did work earlier today. And um, this is just to prove to you that I am doing a live demo. So anyway, um, I will file a bug report here and get this worked out cleaner. So, but this is just to give you an idea. I actually, I'm thinking as I've been doing this that I'm gonna give a focus for just on doing some of the more advanced metadata features, in which case we can come back and look at this some more. All right. So let me go back to the presentation. Uh, that was metadata. So let's look at, so just, okay, so those are some of the things you can do with metadata. This is a really high level and fast. And again, I've tried to include links for all the documentation here because I know I'm going through everything really quickly. So I just want to make, a, take an, as, make an aside here and point out one of the complications. So we have three different metadata systems in Cybers. The one that I was just showing you is the DE metadata. And it is the most powerful. It allows you to have ontology terms. It allows you to build nested hierarchies. Um, it has advanced search features. Um, but it, has to, it only works within, within the discovery environment and the, or, or via the discovery environment API. Um, IROD's metadata um, is the default metadata system that comes with IROD's, which is the storage system behind our data store. And the um, primary advantage of using IROD's metadata is that it's very easy to script using something called I commands. So you can use the I meta command and add metadata. It's still indexed and discoverable through the discovery environment, um, but it, it doesn't allow you to have templates or nested metadata or onto use ontology terms. Um, and so that was why we generally recommend using the DE metadata whenever possible. Um, and finally, the BISC metadata, if you're using, if you're doing image analysis, we use have the BISC image analysis and, and image management platform. Um, and it has its own metadata system, which is as powerful as the DE metadata, if not more so, because it also includes graphical annotations and scraping of metadata from images, et cetera. Um, so if you're focusing on image metadata, you may want to use the BISC metadata. And um, 
you know, you can search through the Living Center and there's some documentation on that. All of these are searchable. They're all indexed in our search engine and they're all um, scriptable. You can use an API and command line to do any of these. So it's easiest with IRODs. It's still entirely possible with either of the others. Okay, so moving on past metadata because that's not all there is to actually making your data fair. Um, as I mentioned, practicing reproducible science is really important part of making your data fair. We have a number of tools um, for, for, um, for reproducible analyses within Cybers. The last um, focus forum was on using VICE, the Visual Interactive Computing Environment. Um, you can use that to, to run Jupyter Notebooks or RStudio that let you track your re research. Um, you can set up Atmosphere instances, which is a cloud platform. So you can use this, um, easy, uh, this easy installation to actually run Jupyter Notebooks or RStudio from within Atmosphere. Or if you set up a complex um, uh, work system on Atmosphere, then you can actually image that and share it with your collaborators or publish that and get a DOI for it as well. Um, and of course, we use Docker to containerize the apps that are in the discovery environment. So there's a, a F1000 research article on how to set that up. Again, there was a previous focus forum on that that you can go to. So then you've got your data, you've analyzed it, you want to make it public. Hooray, I'm, I'm happy that you want to do that. And there are a number of different ways that you can do it. Um, the two sort of simplest ways, the, the very simplest ways just to create a public link. Um, and there's documentation on how to do that. Now, I, this is not um, publishing at all. So the reason there's a little warning sign here is to bear in mind that this, doesn't not, this does not publish your data because bear in mind that it's just a link that you generated. It's not stable. It's not permanent. There's no metadata associated with it. Uh, a next step up from that is creating a community release data folder. And so here's documentation on how to do that. Community release data folders are for projects where um, working as a group, they're generating lots of data, and they want to make that data available to the public um, as quickly as possible. And so the data sets might be evolving, they may be changing and growing constantly, so they're not stable, they're not necessarily permanent, but they're out there and available. Um, and I should say also that um, the community release data folders predates the Cybers' ability to publish data and give DOIs. And so there are a number of folders in there where people are like, hey, I want to make my data publish public. How do I do it? Well, we'll make this folder public for you. That was before we had the ability to make DOIs, before we even really, before fair data principles even existed. Um, and so unfortunately, most of the data that's in those community release folders is not fair. Um, and this looks a little scary. So this is that same analysis that I showed earlier for the comparing um, the, the curated data to the community release folders. And you can see that the most of the community release folders, they don't have a globally persistent, unique and persistent identifier. They don't have rich metadata. Some of them have great metadata. Some of them have no metadata whatsoever. Um, they're on a good positive side, they are available for, via um, you know, the cybers, they're all the very cybers protocols. So they are fairly accessible, um, but there's no metadata again. And so um, I would love to work with the owners of community release folders to actually try to make their data more fair. In fact, people who are now requesting folders, anyone who's requested one within the past six months is under more scrutiny than people in the past. And so they're now required to include metadata. And I work with them to try to organize their data and make it fair as much as possible. And I encourage the folder, the folder, uh, folder owners to, if not for their entire data set, to at least request DOIs for parts of their data set. So, um, so I would say that the data that's in the community release section of the data commons is transitioning to becoming more fair, um, but it's not really considered published yet. It's still incredible. So this should be a really important point. Just because it's not fully fair doesn't mean it's not useful. It is publicly available. It's still incredibly useful. It's searchable. It's discoverable. Um, most of it is, in, you know, is available for people to use. So it's still of intense, incredible value. It's just not as valuable as it could be if it makes them for those future steps to being more fair. Um, and then finally, sort of the, the way to make your data the most fair is then to publish it. And so we have several platforms. Um, you can, if you're, if you're creating sequence data, we don't want to publish it on Cybers. It should go to NCBI. It should go to one of the INSDC centers, so NCBI, EBI, um, or JGDB. And so we have pipelines if your data is already, if you've been analyzing your data, working with it on Cybers, it's already there. Rather than downloading it, going it through the fairly difficult process of publishing to NCBI, we have steps, uh, tutorials that will walk you step by step through publishing to SRA, the sequence read archive, or the whole genome shotgun sequencing archive. Um, and we'll be working on probably submission to other pipelines depending on what people want and need. And then finally, um, you can sort of uh, <laughs> the, uh, the crown jewel here is that you can actually publish 
your data to the Data Commons repository. Um, and so this is, I, I have created a, a quick start on doing that. It is a lot of steps um, and you have to read them and follow them carefully. And if you don't, I will be writing to you and saying, please go back and read step two and make sure you did it right. I'm not gonna do it for you. Um, so if you're good at following directions, you will love this. If you don't like reading directions, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, please suggest to me a better way to make this happen and we're trying to make it easier. But I don't think it's difficult. I mean, you just have to go and go through the step by step. Um, first, figure out, is your data actually right? You know, is this actually the right place to publish your data? What does it mean? Here's some FAQs. Um, then you have to go on to organize your data. Here's steps on how to organize your data. Um, you need to create a readme file. You need to create, uh, you need to name your folder appropriately. It's an arbitrary naming system just to make sure that we don't have naming conflicts. Um, you need to create an inventory file. It's not difficult, but you do need to make sure that you read and follow those directions. Then you need to add the metadata. Here's step-by-step -step instructions on how to do that. Finally, then you submit your quest. I review it. Um, if it's good, you get a DOI. If it needs a few changes, if it needs very trivial changes, I see a typo or something, I'll just fix that myself. If it needs um, some major changes, get back in touch with you um, and have you, help you to do it. And then once it's published, um, you can do, there's various steps on what you can do to get your data noticed. And I will say that in addition to things that you can do, we at Cyverse are one of the first users out of these 1,500 repositories at, um, that, that use DataCite. We are about one of about five that actually use the um, schema.org. So to have our indexed, have our data indexed by the different search engines. So if we go to Google data set search, this is, a, this is a brand new feature on Google. So you can search for data. It's a bit like Google Scholar, only for data. So suppose I go, you know, to, I don't remember how it's spelled. Let me just try G2F, see what that turns up. Okay, so here are the data sets. So it discovers these data sets that are in the Cybers Data Commons. There's also a G2F data set that's in Figshare. Um, so you can see that uh, of the of the result of the seven results or so, four of them are data sets that have been published in the Cybers Data Commons. So, so including metadata that's searchable is really important and your data set can then be discovered on Google or various other places. Okay, and I think that's the end of my presentation. And we have time for a few questions here. And we've got some questions that came in on the chat that I'm gonna take a look through, just give me a second. And I believe that you can unmute now and ask questions. So let me let me go through the ones that are on the chat first and then, then we'll unmute and allow other additional questions. So in principle, you could have multiple DOIs associated with the data set, that's absolutely right. For example, multiple papers would publish using the same data set would each have their own DOI. Um, um, the data set itself would have its own DOI. Yes, that is, no, that is not a problem. And so this is um, one of the fair principles was, let me see. I can, I'll, I'll, sorry to look at it in red, but here, um, include qualified references to other metadata. So um, part of the da data site metadata profile that goes with any published data set um, includes a field that's called related identifiers and identifier and relationship type. So what all of these papers should ideally be doing is each DOI should have metadata that, that points to the other DOIs and then accurately describes the rate relationship like described in or describes or derived from or derived or, or part of it's part of etc so there are a number of relationships that are used to link these different data sets um, do sra and geo issue duis no they do not so at some level you could say that um, data in in insdc is not completely fair because it doesn't have um, stable permanent globally resolvable identifiers however they do have sr they do have um, sra ids or do ids and so there, there is an identifier for them. It may not be as fully functional as a DOI, but they're, they are reasonably fair, but they don't have DOIs. Um, question from Tina, is there a best license type for fair data? The best license type is, is I would say, um, open access, which means it's, it's, um, you don't technically put a license on it, so you, you, know, you say this, 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 uh, this data is in the public domain, and that's actually what we ask you, people, um, to use when they come to Cybers to publish in the Data Commons. You can either use a Creative Commons Zero, which is open size, or a, an ODC PDDL, which is the um, Open Data Consortium, and I don't remember what the PDDL stands for, Public Data Something Data License. 
Um, and so those are those are open size. So so the Creative Commons, which also issues license, so that the sort of next step up is called CCBY. I don't remember what the BY stands for, but essentially a CCBY says anybody can reuse this data for any purpose, but they should cite it. And so the reason that we suggest that people use um, open make their data open source rather than CC BY is that it does. Um, it doesn't remove the scientific cultural obligation to cite the data, but it does make it easier for people to reuse it in a bulk fashion without having to, um, without the concern that they may have made a mistake in citing it. So you have to be sort of willing to take that risk that someone might not cite you properly, even though ethically they should. Um, and as, um, let me go back to one of the slides, as you can see in the data commons for every data set that's published, we do include the citation and we allow people to download it in bin text or EndNote or plain text. So, so we try to make it as easy as possible for people to recite data. Okay, another question. Does Cybers facilitate submission to repositories? I think I, I think I answered that before you must have asked after you asked it. Okay, so are there any other questions? Either in chat or oh. sorry. It's okay. Uh, people can unmute themselves if they need to, and I think that. Everybody has. Um, are there other questions for Ramona? You're welcome to speak or to mute yourself. Okay, you were pretty exhaustively thorough, Ramona. That was <laughs> well, this was this was very thorough, but it was very um, very high level. Mm -hmm. um, and so, please do reach out to me if you have more specific questions. Um, if you're curating, if you're working on a data set, and you know you go to the documentation and it doesn't make sense, or you have suggestions on how to improve it. Um, I always welcome those. That's my job is to listen to you and to try to um, try to make this easier for you. And if you are on here and you're the owner of a community release data folder, I would love to work with you one-on-one -on, -one on trying to um, to make your data more fair and, and get some metadata on there, really. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, Ramona, and thank you, everyone, for attending. As I mentioned, we'll be uh, scheduling some more uh, focus forum webinars for 2019, so stay tuned for those. And I'll also be sending an email out um, with the post-webinar survey. Like I said, it's under three minutes to finish it, and we do value your, your input and your feedback. So thank you, everybody, and see you next time. Thank you. Bye.